Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us during Lithum Partners Winter 2024 Investor Select Conference. My name is Roger Weiss, and I'm a Vice President of Lithum Partners. In this presentation, we welcome Bryce Rowe, Senior Analyst at B. Riley Securities, who covers business development companies, or BDCs, which are business lenders. Bryce is a 20-year veteran and expert in these financial services firms. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that later today, four BDCs, specifically Capital Southwest, Gladstone, Saratoga, and Trinity Capital, will be speaking with Bryce in separate fireside chats. All right, Bryce, let's begin. Um, Bryce, could you please introduce yourself and give a brief overview of what a BDC is and why they're different from banks and other lenders? Sure, well, uh, Roger, thanks for thanks for having me. Um, yes, I am Bryce Rowe, uh, one of the uh, equity research analysts within B. Riley Securities. Um, I do need to read a disclosure here, um, so I'll do that and then jump into it. Um, in the normal course of its business, B. Riley Securities, Inc., or any of its affiliates seek to perform investment banking and other services for various companies, including those covered in research reports and to receive uh, compensation for such services. We remind uh, listeners not to disclose uh, material non-public information um, and no investment opinion are implied or should be inferred from this presentation. All right, so with that out of the way, Roger, um, just a real quick uh, overview about kind of my, my history, my career. Um, I've, I've been on the sell side for almost 24 years now. Um, spent longer stints at Leg Mason and Baird and shorter stints at National Securities and Hubby. Uh, I've been at uh, B. Riley now for about a year and a half. Um, over that 24 years, um, I have covered both commercial banks and business development companies, I actually picked up the BDCs at the tail end of the financial crisis. And um, I think that kind of gives me a bit of a different perspective on the space, and we can certainly get into that later. Um, so, you know, what, what is a BDC uh, or a business development company? Um, a BDC is a corporate tax structure that was created by Congress in 1980 to stimulate the flow of capital to smaller private U.S. businesses. Um, a BDC generally invests um, in U.S. small businesses, and, and the, the market for BDCs has really evolved since 1980, such that most BDCs predominantly make debt investments or they lend to small business businesses in the uh, in the U.S. Um, and and so maybe one question you might have is why why do they make debt investments as opposed to um, you know more more so equity investments? And really, it's it's it generates a stable source of income um, for dividends to pay to shareholders um, and and BDCs uh, are required by by statute to pay out 90 percent plus of their income. And so you, you get a nice dividend stream from the BDCs as a uh, as a shareholder of, of the BDCs. Got it. That's great. You know, I, I think about BDCs as kind of coming in different flavors, if I can use that term. Is that a fair way to think about them? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, the, the 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 investment focus or the strategy, you know, of a particular BDC is going to vary. Uh, you have some BDCs that focus on the lower middle market, so companies that have, you know, EBITDA, maybe $15, $15 million or below. You have some that are more focused on the middle market. Uh, you have some that are focused on the, the higher end of, of the upper middle market, or of the middle market called the upper middle market. And then you also have some um, that are more focused on kind of the, the venture space, uh, you know, companies that are that are supported by venture capital firms. Um, and then, you know, honestly, you have you have some some BDCs that uh, you know that are that are hybrids in that they're doing both little mark both lower middle market as well as middle market um, type of investing. Um, if if you kind of look at how the sector, I talked about how the sector has kind of evolved um, since 1980, um, and it's and it's still kind of in its earlier earlier uh, phase of of maturity. In 2012, there. Um, there, there were there were only three BDCs um, with a uh, with a with a market cap greater than a billion dollars. The aggregate market cap um, of the space back then was less than twenty billion. 
Um, and then you fast forward to, to, to today, uh, you've got you know almost 14 BDCs with a billion dollars of market cap. And the aggregate market cap for the space is around or maybe even a little bit higher than $60 billion. So, you know, we, we've grown threefold, you know, in, in roughly 10 years, a little bit over 10 years. Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, that's an important thing to think about as an investor in the space. Um, Great. Go ahead. No, I, I was going to say within that also, um, aren't there externally managed BDCs and then internally managed BDCs? And kind of what's the distinction and, and is it an important distinction here? It, it, it most definitely is an important distinction. Um, most of the BDCs, you know, I, I track about 38 at this point, um, and they're more than that, but, you know, they're 38 that are kind of more prominent than, than others. Um, of those 38, you only have four that are internally managed. Uh, the other 34 are externally managed. And really, you know, the, the way to think about externally managed BDCs is they're, they're earning um, a fee based on the level of assets that they manage. And then they can also earn um, an incentive fee based on profitability. Um, and internally managed BDCs are a bit different. Uh, they have a, an income statement that looks very much like any other operating company. So they're paying salary and benefit expense. They've got rent expense. They've got other uh, G&A type, type of expense. Um, so again, it, it's going to look a lot more like you know, your typical operating company. Um, you know, the, the main difference between the two is the internally managed BDCs can capture operating leverage as they grow. So as assets grow, um, they, can, they can generate better profitability with that incremental growth in assets, as opposed to the externally managed BDCs um, that will we'll see their expenses grow at largely the same pace as, as assets that are being managed. Um, and so what that translates to from a market perspective is the internally managed BDCs um, typically trade at a better valuation um, than the externals. And that's a huge competitive advantage. We can certainly get into that in a bit, but it ends up being a huge competitive advantage for those internally managed BDCs. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, just speaking of, of the externally managed ones, uh, I know a lot of those companies are affiliated with larger asset management platforms. And um, how do the BDCs integrate into those platforms and what's the advantage of uh, taking a BDC public if you're one of those asset managers? Um, yeah, so um, you know the, the, there are set, there are a lot of uh, larger asset management platforms um, that, that, that 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 carry BDCs, um, and, and in fact might carry multiple BDCs. Um, you know, some some household names. You've got KKR, um, you've got Blackstone, you've got Oak Tree, Aries. Um, Blue Owl, which is more of a, an alternative asset manager, but but again, um, externally managed BDCs um, within that larger asset management platform. Um, the BDCs really exist in kind of the private credit sleeve of those asset managers, um, and the private credit sleeve would be part of the broader credit sleeve that might include um, you know more liquid, uh, broadly syndicated type of type of type of lending. Or the leverage, um, you know, or, or leverage lending, um, you know, transactions, you know, that the BDCs participate in, um, they can, they, they typically will get distributed across different front, different funds throughout the platform. So, you know, a loan to company X Y Z might might exist in Fund A and BDC X Y Z, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, from a from an employee perspective, the, the employees of the asset management platform are just that. They're employees of the asset management platform and typically not direct employees of the BDCs. So the BDCs essentially kind of rent their time, um, rent the rent the time of the employees as they're you know doing doing what they do from a from an investing perspective. In terms of uh, you know, taking a BDC public, um, you know, I, the, the, the primary advantage is permanent capital. Um, and, you know, as when a BDC comes public, um, you know, it, it can exist into perpetuity, whereas, you know, a private private fund might have a finite life. Um, 
and you know and, and has to you know find an find a liquidity event for its private shareholders um and, and in a lot of cases that is uh that that is that bdc or, or that asset management platform taking the, the the bdc the bdc public got it makes a lot of sense um so i guess moving from the the managerial side to the the actual you know, BDCs, when we think about the balance sheets that these companies have, um, both on the asset side and on the liability side, what constraints uh, do BDCs manage to and, and kind of how do they look at the world? Sure. So, you know, I, I, maybe we just kind of step back a little bit and, and talk about, um, you know, what, what BDCs actually do. I mean, it, it, they essentially lend money to smaller businesses and, you know, coming from the world of covering commercial banks, um, you know, I, it, it certainly made sense to me, um, you know, that, that you have companies that are, that are lending, you know, the difference between commercial banks and BDCs, you know, or a primary difference between the two um, is, you know, they're, they're both lending money, but the, the banks are taking in deposits um, and using those deposits to fund um, fund fund their lending, whereas um, the the BDCs are are using other forms of capital to fund to fund their lending. Um, and you know, and and so I think if you look at the left side of of the BDCs balance sheet, the asset side, it's really it's really represented um, by investments in portfolio companies. Um, those investments again are typically debt investments um, or loans. Uh, but but several BDCs do make equity co-investments alongside alongside those debt investments. Um, so so then if you kind of look at the the liability side of a BDC balance sheet, they uh, the, the 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 liability side largely includes debt capital um, used to fund portfolio company investments, and that debt is you know is really coming in the form of either revolving secured credit facilities, mm -hmm. asset securitizations. Unsecured notes issued institutionally or through retail channels, and then debt associated with um, a U.S. Small Business Administration program called the SBIC program. Um, in terms of constraints, so you know this is a, a, a major difference between the BDCs and banks as well. You know, BDCs are constrained by by regulation on how much debt they can carry, um, and that constraint it used to be actually a one to one. Uh, debt to equity ratio. It was recently increased in 2018 to two to one. Um, but again, you have you have you have you have you have debt on a BDC balance sheet that's going to be way less than what you would have at a bank. A bank's going to carry, you know, four to five times that much um, that much debt, you know, even or that much liability, you know, whether it be in the form of, of deposits or you know or or debt. Um, most BDCs operate with leverage well below that two to one threshold. And, and, and that that's, you know, that that's for a few different reasons. One, you know, it, it creates a little bit of cushion and flexibility for the BDCs, but also uh, you have rating agencies, you know, the S and P's, the Fitches, the Moody's of the world that will uh, that will rate the larger BDCs. And they, they really like to see those BDCs manage to, a debt to equity ratio of 125% or lower. Um, and you know, so you hear, you, you hear many of the BDCs that are rated by those rating agencies talk about a kind of, of a preferred or a target leverage range. You know, lo and behold, it's always kind of, you know, a, a, a 90% up to 125%. Certainly they can, you know, they can, they can flirt above that at times, but uh, the rating agencies will keep them to that. Um, and then also one other point on the liability side, um, the rating agencies also prefer to see unsecured debt um, as a percentage of total debt in a BDC's um, capital structure that you know is 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 relatively healthy. So let's call it 35, 40 percent of total debt is what is what those rating agencies see. So you've you've seen some evolution of the BDC space. Um, you know, it's called it over the last ten years where. You know the BDCs ten years ago were 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 um, were really using um, revolving credit facilities that were secured um, predominantly on on as their liability, and now we've kind of shifted such that unsecured notes make make up a much larger portion 
of their of their capital stack, um, and that again that creates more 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 flexibility um, than 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 you would see with a kind of a, a secured revolving facility that's going to have a borrowing base um, associated with it. Got it. So on uh, apples to apples, though, you know, if you're talking about a rated BDC, it's something that is just slightly above a one-to-one -one leverage uh, on on their equity versus a bank that could be on average uh, seven times levered, um, but has access to the you know federal deposit insurance and can basically fund their balance sheet with federally insured deposits. Correct. That's um, a, that's so a, so a much more you know, I could say this and, you know, the BDCs would provide a much more conservative balance sheet than you would see on average from, from the banking sector. From a leverage perspective, you know, the answer is yes. I mean, I, you know, I think the, uh, you know, the deposit funding, um, at least up until recently was, was lower cost. And so you had more stability um, from that, from that perspective. Um, but but it you know it, it has in fact proven to be a bit more conservative you know as we saw in March and April with uh, with with a, with a few banks kind of going belly up. Yes, uh, well, maybe we'll skip that for a different topic. Uh, right. uh, and and you talked about a, a couple of the key metrics you know certainly for the rated BDCs. What kind of fundamental and and valuation excuse me valuation metrics? Uh, are most relevant for BDCs overall? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, I I tend to look at price to price to book or price to nav as the most relevant valuation metric. Um, you know, I think the market might um, you know might 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 range between focusing on price to nav and maybe dividend yield. Um, as the, the 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 most you know the, the most important valuation metrics, I like to think about price to nav um, because, in my view, one of the main fundamental metrics that 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 you think about is the change in nav per share or change in book book value per share over time, um, and that that really is a reflection of you know, a BDC's credit quality and their underwriting, um, you know, again, over over a period of time. It, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to look at NAV changes on a quarter to quarter basis, um, but you'll certainly see you know, those, those BDCs with better fundamental or credit performance are gonna show um, NAV per share that is either flat over time or it's either, or, or it's gone up um, and then vice, the, the, vice versa. So that, that's why I look at price to nav as the uh, the most relevant kind of valuation metric. You know, from a fundamental perspective, in addition to you kind know, of the change in nav, we look at return on equity. Uh, return on equity is going to capture, um, you know, the, the 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 credit credit performance, not just kind of what the what the BDC is earning before um, credit marks, uh, but it's also going to capture that credit mark, and so that that's an important. Um, fundamental metric. The other two, we just talked about debt to equity. Um, that's important. And then asset yield is a is another one. And we kind of measure that as, as revenue over assets. Um, you know, the higher the asset yield, um, you know, typically you, you have better better ability to meet a meet a meet a dividend um, or at least provide a higher dividend yield um, you know if you have a higher asset. Very good. And just to confirm, uh, NAV uh, is net asset value in terms of talking about uh, the the loans they put on their books. Exactly. Net asset value. Right. Got it. You know, one thing that um, I've heard is that, you know, for institutional investors who are looking at uh, potentially investing, uh, generally they shy away from investing in BDCs, uh, even though they've got um, what has been a strong track record and and good yields what keeps you know some mutual funds from you know diving into the pool as it were that uh, that's an excellent question um so the bdcs were were actually removed from market indices in um in 2014 uh, so the, like the s&p and the russell um and and the reason they were removed uh, was because BDCs are considered, you know, a, a closed-end fund, um, and the expenses of closed-end funds get uh, get 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 bulked into 
the expenses of mutual funds. And so if you're operating a mutual fund and you own some BDCs, your expenses are going to get inflated um, by the expenses of, of BDCs. Um, this, is, this is referred to as the AFFE or Acquired Fund Fees and Expenses um, issue. And, um, and so with that you know, removal in 2014, you know, there was less, you know, less pressure, if, if you will, for in institutional investors to, um, to invest in the space because they were not, the BDCs were not included in their benchmarks. Uh, the benchmarks that they're, that they're um, you know, uh, that, 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 that kind of, that, that judge how, how they, they do comp themselves they, to, yeah. performance perspective. Um, yeah. And so that you know, and and, and it, you know, and, and if you think about the BDCs back back then, um, there weren't as many. Uh, they had gone through a, a period of maybe you know subpar performance, um, and there there wasn't much market cap aggregate market cap. So for a for a fund manager to get involved, um, they kind of have to take a, a cur some career risk um, to to invest in the BDCs, and many have kind of decided not to do that. Got it. Because it's funny, because when I think of, you know, the structure, it's it's essentially the same thing as a mortgage REIT, which are, you know, public companies. And pretty much it seems anybody and everybody, uh, you know, depending on the time frame, uh, will invest in. So, yeah. you know, odd that, you know, in in one case, you know, enjoy yourself. The water is fine. In the other case, yeah, we're going to penalize you, Mr. or Miss Portfolio Manager. Yeah. And, and honestly, Roger, the you know the, the industry has um, you know has a lobbying effort to um, to try to you know change this rule, this AFFE rule, and they've gotten traction from time to time. Um, it is both uh, an SEC issue, but it could also be kind of a le legislative issue that Congress could um, could deal with. Um, but you know we've had administrative administration changes and have gotten kind of close to the finish line. A couple times, uh, but but never never gotten quite there. So I think I think the 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 sector and those that, that participate in the sector would prefer um, it to go away. You know, my my view is that you know you've had this you know this 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 move towards private credit or direct lending as an asset class. Um, you've had the growth in the BDC sector, you know, number of BDCs as, as well as aggregate market cap, and you know at some point institutional investors, fund managers are going to have to start paying attention to them, especially as they, you know, as the BDCs have really shown that they can perform or outperform, um, you know, publicly traded banks from a, from a return. Yeah, you know, makes sense. Well, we'll keep an eye on that space and, you know, hopefully uh, in the not too distant future, it will get, uh, get resolved. Uh, let's continue forward. Um, and, and, you know, we we've seen obviously in terms of market and interest rates, it's been an interesting last certainly twelve months. Uh, how have the BDCs overall been performing uh, as rates have have ratcheted up? Uh, what is a I guess an ideal environment for BDCs, and uh, what kind of environment do the BDCs kind of hope to avoid? Yeah, so the BDCs have performed exceptionally well. Um, in this period of, of rising interest rates. Um, and that's because their balance sheets are really geared to higher short-term rates. Uh, the, the assets or the loans that they make are all floating rate for the most part. Um, and then the right side of their balance sheet has some, some portion of their, uh, of their capital that is fixed rate. Um, so you get, you get widening margins, um, interest margins, um, and, and earnings growth. And you know the other thing that didn't happen was Credit quality is held up um, even with with the higher rates. Um, so you know certainly uh, the, the 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 earnings growth has helped to to support better dividend coverage. Uh, we've seen dividend coverage, you know, average about one hundred and thirty percent for the past couple of quarters. That compares to something closer to a hundred hundred percent before you know before rates started to kind of flow through uh, the BDC income statement. So you know, really you know really good. Really good outcome um, from that perspective. You know, credit-wise, you know, NAV per share has compressed by roughly six to seven percent on average since 2021. Some BDCs have actually experienced some NAV expansion, uh, but that level of decline 
you know, isn't isn't hard losses at this point. You have some mark to market losses that could come back. And so I think, you know, I think the BDCs have performed really well from a credit perspective since 2021. Um, in terms of the stocks, I mean, we, we saw a, a median total return of 23 to 24 percent in 2023. And that outpaced the, the Russell 2000 and, you know, and the bank index by a very wide margin. So it was nice, to, nice to see the space really perform as well as it has. Um, you know, in terms of moving forward and in the environment, you know, I, my view is that is that a higher for longer is actually a better environment for the BDCs. You know, you're going to maintain the margins where they are, um, and it also would mean that the the macro the macro backdrop or the, the 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 economy is performing pretty well to you know to 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 be able to maintain rates at a higher level for longer. Um, Flip side of that would be, you know, I would say, you know, more drastic, um, aggressive rate cuts. And I think that would that would likely signal the Fed is behind the eight ball macro uh, macro trends are deteriorating. And you know, that could lead to higher defaults um, and, you know, and worse credit performance for for the BDCs. Right. So, so the risk is that the world is, you know, from a credit standpoint, ending again. And the Fed is going to a fire drill of of cutting rates, and oh my God! Uh, and it's not that the the drastic cut in rates is necessarily negative to BDC. It's that the underlying uh, credits themselves could deteriorate in that kind of environment. Yeah, I mean it's a you know macro a deteriorating macro backdrop would mean the businesses aren't performing well, and you know you might have higher defaults, higher non accruals. Um, you know the the lower interest rates are. Are definitely a negative for for earnings. I mean, you would you would see some earning some of the earnings growth get given back, so to speak. Um, but you'd likely need to see, let's call it 100 basis points or maybe 150 basis points of rate cuts before that really filtered through um, to you know to 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 raise a red flag. Got it. But, but clearly, given the the returns that they had last year, uh, it's it's been a very good environment. Absolutely. And and I was going to say, given that, I think last week we saw one BDC, a new BDC go public. Uh, there are a couple more that have filed to go public and another announced its intention to go public. Um, and I know recently uh, you were ahead of the curve with some downgrades on uh, a number of the companies that you follow. Um, can we call a top to the current BDC cycle? You know, kind of where do you think where you sit right now in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, it certainly is an opportune time for these BDCs to, you know, to go public or, or announce intentions to go public um, because you've got, you, you've got valuations that are at this point at, at a cycle high. Um, you know, again, we talked about price to NAV earlier. Price to NAV on average is about 94, 95% for the externally managed BDCs. And rarely do you see the group as a whole trade above NAV. So, um, you know, I think I think those those funds that are going public are trying to take advantage of the, the better valuation environment. Um, and you know, and, and and so far looks looks good from that perspective. Um, you know, in, in terms of kind of where we are, we did downgrade. You know, 10, 10 of the nineteen BDCs under coverage um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, against you know with that valuation framework kind of um, against against the macro backdrop kind of being a little bit more uncertain and prospects for rate cuts and, and it certainly feels a bit toppy to me not to say that we're going lower hard um, but you know the 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 point we made in that research piece was that you know sideways to lower feels more probable than than continuing to move higher and so it took a took a step back and and want to see how how the economy performs um, over over the near term, um, and see how the BDCs perform over the near term too. Got it. Well, with that being said, uh, kind of looking out a little bit further, uh, what excites you most about the group and the group's future? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's. I think it's it's a great time, and we talked earlier about you know a relatively immature point in their in their life cycles. Um, and you know, again, you've seen this evolution of of the space, um, of the BDC space, really coincide with you know, private credit or direct lending as an asset class taking share away from the banks. 
Um, and that really started to emerge um, out of the great financial crisis as regulations um, hampered the ability of banks to, to lend like the BDCs lend or, or lend like they used to lend. Um, so, you know, I, I think, you know, I think that's part of it. The corporate borrowers are increasingly attractive to private credit providers or direct lenders um, because they, they offer, you know, you know, speed of execution terms are maybe a little bit more expensive, more documentation that comes with um, the, the direct lenders. But the offsets are, again, speed of execution, certainty of closing, um, and just a bit more flexibility to, uh, to, to access those, those capital solutions. So, um, you know, the, the BDCs are, the, the number of BDCs are growing. Again, aggregate market caps going up. Um, they're able to handle larger, um, larger loans, larger transactions, um, given their, their increased balance sheets. So it's a, it's a, it's a nice time, I think, to, to be a BDC. Um, and I would imagine that, you know, the, 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 the space will continue to uh, get, capture some traction as we move forward. And then again, if this AFFE issue is dealt with, then I think you're, you're, you're going to see, you know, people really plow into the sector. Very good. I know we're getting close to the end of our time. Uh, is there anything else that might be helpful for investors to uh, think about and understand about BDCs? No, I, I think we've covered a lot, Roger. I mean, I would, I would, I would say that if anybody has questions, feel free to uh, reach out, um, email or phone, and um, would be happy to kind of talk through, talk through the space, talk through specific ideas. Um, but uh, really appreciate um, the opportunity here, and uh, also look forward to. Um, to moderating some uh, some of the fireside chats with uh, four of the BDCs I cover, um, so and, and that will that will that will that will be uh, an exciting thing for me to be for me to do. Excellent, we're we're looking forward to watching those as well. Uh, Bryce, again, thank you for your time today, uh, and we we greatly appreciate it. Uh, to everybody out there. Uh, who's not already signed up for a uh, BDC one-on-one -on -one with one of the four companies that Bryce just uh, just mentioned, uh, please feel free to send me an email at weiss at lithampartners.com uh, or again, visit uh, our website for this conference at uh, www.lithampartners.com slash select 2024 uh, and then click on the one-on-one -on -one meeting request button. Uh, we hope you all enjoy the conference and, and thank you so much again.